morning. Morning. How's everyone doing today? We're here. You're here. You're here. You're here as well. Welcome to the service of Emmanuel United Church of Christ down here in Dousman, Wisconsin. No matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, whether you join us in person or online, I hope you find a welcome and a community here. Speaking of online, last week we said hello to some folks who joined us online. So good morning to Mike and Julie Ball and to Bill and Betsy Welsh. Hello friends and everyone else who's joining us online. Will you join me in our call to worship? We come to this place of prayer for oh, here are. we are in our hopes and dreams. We come to this place of grace. For, for here we learn compassion, joy, and discover how deeply we come with these people called the church. And to be blessed by the variety of gifts to live, to live as one. As one. All right, good morning. Will you join me in singing called as partners in Christ's service? All four verses, <laughs> just for Don. <laughs> Join me in a moment of honesty as we pray together a prayer of confession. Gracious God, we forget that in you we have our life and being. We ignore that you also created our brothers and sisters who seem so different from us. We say that we love you, but we do not keep your word. We rush by those we in need those and, and not and even a thought, not even that, thought they that they could be our friends. Lord, forgive us Lord, forgive and, us. Help us and help us focus back, back on, on you. you. 
and in focusing on and you, focusing help us to help heal us the heal world around that around we may have we been neglected. Help us day. learn help to us walk learn in to your walk. way. Amen. Amen. In the beginning was God, and at the end there will be God, and in every moment in between there is God creating, redeeming, and sustaining us. Through Christ, gracious love is poured into our empty souls. Through the Spirit, peace becomes the gift we can share with those around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And so, friends, it is a moment where we practice the sharing of peace. We practice the sharing of peace in this time because it's a little harder and it's a little more difficult. And so we practice our distance, peace, and so beloved community, peace be with you. Also with you. And also with you. Also with you. Share it with each other, too. <laughs> We're not going far. Book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 to 40. We set sail from Troyes and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. 
After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. When morning came, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul, saying, The magistrate sent word to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, They have beaten us in public, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And now they are going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home. And when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. Friends, listen to what the Spirit would say to us today. That was a long one. <laughs> Will you join me in prayer, our prayer together? We've done this a couple of weeks. We're going to do it again. If you're able to stand up, great. If you don't want to stand up, that's okay too. If it's difficult, I totally understand. So, you can repeat after me. God, you are above, God, you are above below, below, inside, inside and, all around. and all around. We are so glad you love us. We are so glad you love us. Help us, and help us to grow. Help us to grow. And we love you too. We love you. Amen. All right. There's a lot, a lot in that story. Like, why didn't the guard call for the lights before he thought he should kill himself? Which didn't occur to me until I was just hearing it now. Like, look, get a light, man. Anyway, I want you to think with me for a moment about something you do well. How did you get there? There might be some things that you're predisposed at being better at than others, but to be really good, you've got to commit. You've got to try. You have to practice. You have to work at it. When I was younger, I played the flute. I did not like to practice. I practiced just enough to be okay. And I was a swimmer, and I practiced during those three, four months of the high school swim season, and then I didn't the rest of the year. I was also okay at that. I probably could have been better. 
I could have committed more time and energy. What did or do you practice? In this community, we have musicians of all kinds, from piano and flute, drums and even accordion. There, of course, are runners and cyclists and rock climbers. There are sewers, quilters, artists of all kinds. For an interview, for an article, at the beginning of his 60th year, Yo-Yo Ma tells a joke. A celloist walks on a beach and picks up a bottle, and a genie pops out and says, I will give you two wishes. This is a cheap genie. The celloist says, wow, I'd like to have world peace. And the genie thinks for a second and says, that is too hard. What is your second wish? And the celloist says, well, I'm turning 60. I want to play in tune. And the genie thinks for a second and says, what was your first wish again? <laughs> you know, your ma says, what all string players have in common is that if we don't play for a while, we actually start from ground zero. And I'm sure that's not, that's true for other things than just playing the strings. And I am sure you've heard someone say that practice makes perfect, and maybe that's why I didn't practice. Perfection was never my goal, and honestly, it seems utterly unachievable. It's a lie they tell you that practice makes perfect. Instead, they should say that practice changes the synapses in your brain and creates memories in your muscles so that it's easier. If Yo-Yo Ma, who was good enough as a child to play for the president, needs to practice at 60, I think we probably do too. Of course, what does this have to do with being a follower of Jesus and living and being the church? And I would argue everything. What we find in our story today are Lydia, Paul, and Cyrus and Silas is what it is to live as a disciple of Jesus, following and being followers of the way and practicing discipleship. We'll start with Lydia. And I wish we had more time to really talk about the women in this story because Lydia is a woman of means. She runs her own business. She has money. She has surrounded herself with a community of women who care about each other to worship God, and are seeking to live more fully into what it means to be a follower of Jesus, she's kind of amazing. She wasn't new to this Jesus story, but since Paul and Silas and whoever else were in town, her community and her household were baptized. And since they had no place to stay, she made room for them. Welcoming and hospitality. It's who we are called to be as to make space in our churches, in our homes, and in our lives for everyone. It's Zacchaeus in a tree being invited back into community. It's Abraham and Sarah welcoming the three strangers into their home for a meal. And it's you and how your community welcomes newcomers, have made them feel like they're part of this Emmanuel family have you been part of Emmanuel for a long time? Keep welcoming people. Are you newer to Emmanuel? Do you remember the welcome you received? Share it with another. And of course, this doesn't just mean we welcome the people who come through our doors or in our parking lot, but all of those that we meet to find a welcome in us because we are the church. We are the welcome. We are making space for the other, for the to bite into community, to grow together. Hospitality means welcoming the stranger, the sojourner, the immigrant, the marginalized, the oppressed, the neglected into community, into family, and into life together. That is what Lydia did. She was the warm, welcoming aunt you see who has um who sees you all as a future friend and welcomes into a meal together. She's my grandma, 
who is in fact a grandma to everyone, even those she's literally just met. And she knows no strangers, just future friends who are in need of purse peppermints or smarties. This is lifelong work of overcoming fears of difference, of being willing to grow and change yourself, hearing new ways of the world. Welcoming the stranger is counterintuitive, even if it is an ancient practice, because we fear and flee from what is different because that's kind of how our brains and our animal instincts tell us we might get hurt. And so it is a practice that we have to do. Our next few lessons come from Paul and Silas. They find a woman who has a spirit in her that lets her tell the future. And no doubt this woman was making bank with that gift for people who owned her. And here's a place where I think Paul missed the mark a little. She was liberated from her demon, but still, in fact, a slave. In fact, now she is a significantly less useful slave, and we don't know what happens to her. If she is set free to fend for herself, or if she remained with these people who decided they owned her, it would be the right thing to do, and they certainly thought that it was the right thing to do to set her free of that spirit, but sometimes liberation is about liberating to a full and abundant life. Our work of compassion, of feeding and clothing and setting free, which is amazing and necessary, and it cannot be done without acknowledging why people are hungry or without sufficient clothing and what circumstances led them to incarceration. Often, when someone today is freed from prison, they aren't given any resources to survive. They have no community to support them. And when women around the world lifted up their voices to tell stories of sexual assault, of how they were brought into freedom, how were they brought into freedom and wholehearted living? And 30 years ago, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed with the help of the United Church of Christ. Did you know we were significantly a part of that? But how today are we standing alongside persons with disabilities today when there are many ways the world remains inaccessible? How do our practices of justice and liberation lead to abundant living for all? And look, Paul and Silas, they did the right thing. And I really wish I knew how it turned out for that woman. But for Paul and Silas, no good deed goes unpunished. They ended up in prison. The first noble truth of Buddhism is that all life involves suffering. And I'm going to suggest that there is a practice of suffering that is related to being a disciple, but I need you to listen really carefully to the next part. God does not cause you to suffer. Human beings, living among human beings, being part of human, humanity and our systems will. It is inevitable. And we are a part of a part of a community, part of a faith, part of a practice that asks us to do things that are counterintuitive, that are not the way the world runs. And the world would rather ignore the hungry with a sign and are called, and we are, call, and we are called to free them and to welcome them. The world would rather forget persons in prison, painting them in the worst possible light, and we are called to visit and to care for and to make space for. We are called to stand up and speak for those who can't raise their own voices and stand up and step aside for those who face, who can speak up in the face of injustice, violence, hatred, oppression, neglect, abuse. And sometimes that comes with a cost. Sometimes it costs relationships, money. Sometimes it comes with ridicule. What good is it to help one when there are so many others who need help? The way we love, the way of love that we learned from Jesus cost him his life. Our practice of suffering 
It is because we are doing right, and it isn't because we are putting ourselves in a place of making ourselves martyrs or victims. It is a place of not letting the suffering hold us back, not letting it keep us from loving, not letting them succeed at making us feel small or insignificant, because we are not. We are beloved by God, and we are not alone. And when Paul and Silas were in prison, in the midst of their suffering, they stayed connected to God. They prayed and they sang, they worshiped, they cried out. Worship is a practice. And the first step of any practice is showing up. And it doesn't necessarily mean showing up on Sunday morning to church when we gather now or when we can gather together in the future inside on Sunday morning worships. Sometimes it is just showing up to prayer, to stop and to take an intentional moment of prayer, to take an intentional moment of worship, to take an intentional moment of song. Prayer and worship is remembering that we are not the center of the universe, that there is a God that cares about what is happening to us. Worship is gratitude for the world around us. It is a practice of taking time, showing up, of sometimes feeling ridiculous the first few times, but doing it again. And in the end, Paul and Silas returned to Lydia and her community when they left jail and they stayed with them. And together this community learned and studied and taught. And it seems to me that we too often in the world and churches aren't immune. We think that education is for the young. There isn't anything else for us to learn as we get older, unless you decide to go back to school. And in churches, we often see education and learning as the responsibility of our children. But there is so much we don't know, and so much we can learn, and learning is lifelong. Remember the last documentary you saw, or the book you read, or the video you watched about someone different from you. Remember the last time you learned something new, or received a new perspective on things you've heard, or heard someone else's experience that is so different than yours. There is so much more to learn. Jesus told the disciples that there was more to be revealed that they weren't ready for yet. And Paul in one of his letters says that we see the world through a glass dimmed. We are missing so much, but we are trying to learn and to share what we know with the world around, with those around us. Maybe it is to be a mentor to people younger than us or just in a different place than us, to teach, to tell stories, to advise when advice is asked for. And it is a practice. We practice shutting up when someone else has something to share or to and to share if we practice sharing we practice teaching we practice being taught or being teachers we practice what it means to be disciples and as i put this together today i couldn't help but think and be reminded of the Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, who on June 17, 2015, lived out their discipleship and welcomed a stranger into a time of prayer and study, and then they suffered when the stranger that they welcomed shot nine of them. And that's the scary, scary consequences of living Counter, counter to the world, or a fraction of the world, as the case may be. What we see in their community and in their lives are of those loved ones who were murdered is the living of their discipleship. They suffered, but they continue to worship and continue to pray and continue to offer grace and forgiveness, they still practice what they believe. 
and it takes practice because it's going to be imperfect and it's going to be scary and sometimes we're going to do it wrong and we're going to screw it up and it's going to be imperfect because we're going to be relearning and refining what it is to love God by loving God's people, including by loving ourselves. Because practice doesn't make perfect. Practice is what changes our synapses, and it trains our muscles, and it settles into our bones, and it changes our hearts. And it gets easier, and then it gets harder again, and then it gets easier again. It's a way of practicing and learning and doing. So beloved community, make mistakes. Offer grace to yourself and each other. Ask for forgiveness. But please know when you practice the disciplines of faith, when you practice following the way of Jesus, you are not doing it alone. We are practicing what it is to live as disciples to love God and the stranger, to fight for justice and liberation and abundance, to embrace the consequences with grace and forgiveness, to worship and pray and surrender to, and to gratitude, and to learn and to grow together. And we have each other to do it with. We are not alone. Amen. So a little change in plans. You have a bulletin insert. Um, we're not gonna sing, what was it? Um, whatever the next one was. We're gonna sing Seeky first and stuff. <laughs> As we enter into our time of prayer, for the church, for the world, for each other, here are the prayers of our community this morning. Our weekly prayer 
This morning is with um, Michael Clark and Jeanette Collins. We're continuing to hold in prayer um, Evelyn Faircloth, Greg Jarrett, Lori Bucket's daughter and grandson, Charlene's mom, Marie, Christine Lang. You may have noticed that it was not Sarah who was reading scripture this morning. Uh, Sarah Erickson Bott's uncle, John Erickson, had a heart attack yesterday and Sarah, Sarah drove down to Chicago to be with him. And so we're holding her and him in prayer today. She said he's not doing particularly well. And so our prayers are with John and Sarah this morning. Um, Steve Thomas lifts in prayer his friend Conrad, who lost his husband to a long-term illness. We're holding in prayer uh, Gail and Sal Tomez's son, Andrew, who's serving in Afghanistan. And of course, we're holding in prayer all those who are sick, lonely, separated, working long hours and taking care and being caretakers in the midst of COVID. Will you join me in prayer together? And you are invited if you want to lift names as things come up or respond with uh, Lord have mercy. Because you're far enough away, no one hears you. Because we have been fed and called and our lives joined forever in Christ, we unite our voices in prayer. For the wisdom to know the difference between the word of God and our own words, Lord have mercy for the world, for all nations, for each country's leaders and people, that peace and cooperation may be our common goal. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that we may be a faithful witness and that maintaining unity in the bond of peace, we may know what it means to have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Lord, have mercy. For all people in need, that each person's hunger may be satisfied, each person's pain relieved, for those whom we have named and left unnamed, and for ourselves, Lord, have mercy. And for all who have died, that their journeys are complete and that they share in your glory and rest. Lord, have mercy. For our own community, families, that we may know your presence and embody God's love, Lord, have mercy. And Almighty God, lost in the darkness, we search for light. Surrounded by our created waste, we seek a promised land, threatened by the way we break bonds that make for peace. Help us to find our light, our land, and our peace in you, now and forever. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It is our time of offering, of which we are going to do later. And so I invite you... If you have your offering, you're going to drop it in a box on your way out of the door. If you have loose change for the singing bowl, that is up here. It also can go in the box too, but that's right up here. It continues, I believe, to go to uh, Family Promise and the work of Family Promise. Um, so please, please let's do that. And then we will uh, join me in prayer blessing 
all of our gifts that we offer back to God. The Holy One, you give us so much. May these gifts of our pockets that we have brought forth today, along with the gifts you have made of ourselves, go to serve you today, tomorrow, and beyond. Amen. Amen. I am just realizing I didn't fill in my announcement section. Uh, we are having a council meeting this afternoon, so hang out if you are part of that. This week, we are starting a return to our Bible study. Um, Bible studies on the patio over there. Uh, we also will have it on Zoom, so if you are interested in joining us on Zoom, let us know. We'll be here or we'll be here on the patio. Uh, the next week on Wednesday evenings, we'll start a book study. I don't know who's joining us on that. It's a Zoom only, but I'm really excited. It's a Barbara Brown Taylor. She's a, an Episcopal priest uh, and a fabulous writer. And so I invite you to uh, find that book. If you need some support on, on being able to purchase that, please let us know. Um, Learning to Walk in the Dark came out a few years ago, but it is a delightful um, read on exploring walking through some of our darker times in life and learning to see the light in the midst of it. Um, it seemed appropriate for this time in history. Ooh, we do still need uh, readers. If you're interested in reading as part of scripture during our services, please let me know. Uh, for now, this is continuing to be an this situation um, where we are outside, but that's will probably start transitioning when we uh, when it gets cold out. So it's a uh, it's it's exciting. It's an opportunity to participate in something that'll be evolving, changing, expanding ourselves a little. Do we have anything else this morning? Did I miss something? All right. And let's sing. All right. It's another fun one. I won't force you to clap, but you can if you want from God. May it overflow from you. May you practice compassion and love. May you 
practice what it means to follow. May you offer yourself the grace and know that God goes with you always. Amen. Amen.